might be more like the people in his hometown than we want to admit. Well, I know Jesus. Yeah, he was a carpenter's son. Yeah, he, yeah, I know his mom's name is Mary. He had brothers. He had sisters. I've been around him a long time. I've read his story. I know lots about him. And if that's all there is to him, then that's, that's easy and that's great. And they would have been cool with, Jesus, man, how's it going? Man, we haven't seen you for so long. It's good to have you home. You know, the grocer, he, Jesus comes in to buy milk from the grocer, and he's all excited. I remember when you were just this tall, and it's so good to see you. And Jesus says, it's good to be home. Do you know that I am the eternal God and creator of everything you know? What? Hold on, hold on. Can't, you know. Sometimes I think we're more like his hometown people. We know of him, we know about him, but do we really know him? Do we really know who he is? Do we really know why he came? Is this more than just a ritual? Is this about a real moment in history representing my creator taking my place on the cross and dying for me? The eternal God taking on human form. So Jesus goes home. You saw these questions in the, ta- in the text. Where did this man get these things? These things that he's talking about teaching. What is this wisdom given to him, this, this insight, this understanding he claims to have? And we hear about these miracles. How are miracles being performed by the hands of Jesus from Nazareth, the carpenter's son, the son of Mary? Here's what they knew. You saw this in the text, I hope, too. They know he's a carpenter. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this that kid that grew up here? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this a brother? Isn't this just a guy like us from Nazareth? Here's the questions I asked myself, and I put it personally to you so you could answer it as well. Would you know him if you saw him? Jesus, the eternal creator, has taken on human form, and he's standing in front of them. If you want a picture, they're in a synagogue, and he's up front teaching. So instead of me, imagine Jesus being here, and he's opening up the scroll, and he's teaching. So there he is. He's right in front of them. And the words begin to come out of his mouth, and they hear him. But friends, they don't see him, and they don't hear him. They're scandalized. They're, they're, they're stuck. They can't get past. No, he, this is who he is. This is the details. These are the facts that we know about him as a man. And they don't see him for who he really is and they don't hear him. They don't hear his words. Would we know him if we saw him? If we showed up this morning and next week we have a guest speaker. I'm just going to give you a heads up. It's not Jesus. But... I know, he, didn't, he, he did return my calls, but he said he wasn't available. No, I'm just kidding, he's always here. But he's gonna walk up, and I hope that you will give him a crossroads welcome and that you'll really see him and listen to him because you really wanna know him. You wanna know him more than just a, a guest speaker, his name is Pete, up here, but that you really wanna know him and hear him and what he has to say. Well, think if it was, was Jesus, Would we know him and would we hear him? So, all four Gospels record this moment. Here's what's interesting. All four Gospels have a few different details, but all four of the Gospel writers record the same exact thing that Jesus said when he said, only at home. A prophet has honor except at home, except in his community, except in his family or in his home. All four gospel writers record those exact same words. Now here's what's interesting we don't know. Did he go twice back to his home or did he go once? And I can't tell you that I have certainty that it was one or twice. One, two record where it seems to be earlier on in his ministry and two of the gospels record where maybe it was later in the, in the ministry. And I don't know. But here's what's interesting about the, the record in Luke. What Luke gives us, if it's the first or the second, we know that he's in Nazareth, we know that he's at home, we know that his, his family and his friends are offended by him, and Luke tells us why they're offended. Mark says they have these questions, right? Who does he think he is, and where did this come from, and why is he saying these things and these miracles? Listen to Luke chapter 4. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, which Mark tells us, 
and this was his custom. He stood up to read, he walks up, this was uh, allowed by rabbis to come in, a visiting rabbi in a synagogue, and so he goes up front. By the way, that's where they're first offended, because why is the son of Mary, this carpenter, getting up to read the word of God? He has no business being up there. He walks up, and the one who's in charge of the synagogue brings him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Interesting. He hands it to him. Jesus unrolls it. He finds the place where this is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, he went and sat down, and everyone in the synagogue is staring at him. Their eyes are fastened on him. And he said this to them in that synagogue. He said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What's he claiming? He's claiming to be two things. He's claiming to be the anointed of the Father, which they would know as the Messiah that had been promised in all of their Hebrew scriptures, starting with Genesis chapter three. One born of a woman will one day come and crush the head of Satan. And he's saying, I'm him and I'm here. And the other thing he says is that I was sent by the Father. What is that, why does that matter? Because anything that I do and say has the authority of Yahweh, of who they understand Yahweh to be. I am here anointed by him, I am the promised one, the, I am your Messiah, and I was sent here by the Father, the one you claim to believe and follow. And yes, they were offended. They were scandalized. Now, many of us are going, well, I, well, I would not be scandalized. I would not be offended. But can we be real friends? How many times has it happened to us when we're opening the Word of God or we're here on a Sunday and the Word of God is being taught or in a a life group and the Word of God is being taught and we dismiss it, we lay it aside, we say, you know what, that's ridiculous. We may not say it outwardly, but we're thinking it and we've already decided in our minds that that's offensive, that God would ask me to live this way. God would ask me to say this. God would ask me to stop doing this. Because every other source in my life is telling me that's okay. And it's not going to harm anything. And I can have this in my life, whatever it might be. And you hear from God's word, which is his word. The father sent Jesus, and Jesus then says, this is how I want you to live. I want you to die to yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. You have one right. I am your master, and you are my disciple. And I'm asking you to lay it all down and live your life emulating, practicing what I do and say. And yes, I will send you out. Yes, I will send you to your neighborhood. Yes, I will send you to your school. I will send you to your friends. I will send you maybe to another country, to Mexico for a week. I will send you. You'll never go alone. I'm always with you, and often it'll be two by two. But yes, I will send you to go do things and be things and live a certain way. And yes, I expect you to do it. I expect you to trust me. I expect you to do it. Are you tracking with me? We do the same thing. We're scandalized, we're offended, just like they were. And I wonder, do we really know him? Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's watch this. and the pride. He sympathizes and he saves. He threatens 
captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. Goosebumps right now, something's wrong with you, okay? Check your arms. I can show you mine. It, no? I'm the only one? Don't leave me up here all by myself. Anyone? Okay, well, maybe we need to show it again. Do you know him? Yes. Do I'm, Thank you. But I, I really want to challenge us, each of us individually, in our own hearts and minds. Do I know him? And, and if you answer that question, that, that video is, a, is just a scratching of the surface of who he is, and that is meant to just prompt us to pause and say, okay, do I know him? What do I know about him? Do I know that he, in fact, is the anointed one? And all that comes with being the Messiah. See, he, he, he's not just a great teacher. He's not just this great figure in history. He's not just this mystery. He's not just this point of scandal for all the ages. He is... God. And he was willing, Philippians reminds us, not, not to hold tightly to his place at the right hand of the Father in heaven where everyone worshipped him, everyone obeyed him, everybody recognized him as the ultimate master, king of kings and lord of lords, and he stepped away from that and came down and took on human form where everybody con were confused about him, rejected him misunderstood him, ignored him, tried to kill him. We'll talk afterwards, Wes. And he experienced something very different in heaven. But he didn't cease to be God. He came as God and took on human form, and he walked among us. And in the Gospel of Mark, we're seeing how he taught and how he lived. And at the point that we're in, in chapter 6, he's beginning to be even more clear about what this means for you and I today. And in a word, it means to follow him. Now, we are friends, we're a family, but we're also Americans, and particularly we're Californians. And we're living at the capital of the world where we have a right to everything our way on our timing the way we want it, the temperature <laughs> included. And the Spirit of God is speaking to each of us that have put our faith in him, reminding us this morning, this is who he is. And if this is who he is, I have one right, and that right is to bow before him and lay aside all of my entitlements and say, speak, Master, your servant is listening. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Amen. Do we know him? So it's interesting to me that Mark then records, and starting in, in verse 6 and 7, middle of 6, Jesus turns to, he calls the, the 12, and they begin to do the circuit. And he summons them. He calls them to himself. There's an intentionality. Can I suggest to you that Sunday mornings are not the only time in our life, but Sunday mornings when we gather in this setting and when we gather at 11 o'clock in these different groups, that there's an intention and attention, intentionality to putting ourselves within his sight and with his ears so that we can see and hear him. 
And we can respond, yes, Master, I hear what you want me to do. I hear what you want me to let go of. I hear you want me to put my phone down. I hear you want, sorry. I hear you want me to speak to this person. I, I, I hear you. You want me to go to my spouse and apologize for what I've done. You want me to stop watching that on, on the internet or on my phone. You want me to stop ignoring my neighbor. You want me to stop hiding what I'm hiding. You want, I'm hearing you. I see you. I know who you are, and I hear what you're saying to me. There's an, intention, an intentionality. There's a purpose. Maybe I'll go with that word because I can't say the other one. He is summoning you and me into his presence. Why? So that we could see him for who he is and then we can really hear him. Because he's then going to say, go. He summons them together and then he sends them out. But notice he also gives them authority. They're not doing it in their own strength. If you're frustrated this morning because you really tried to obey him and live for him this week and it just turned out to be a disaster, let me suggest something and I may be wrong. But I'll suggest this. Maybe you were trying to live this week for him in your own strength. Maybe you were trying to do it yourself. Maybe you weren't surrendered to him and his power so that you could obey him. You tracking with me? He summons them. He calls them. He says, I want you in proximity because I I want you to go. And he sends them. And then he makes it very clear. You have my authority. And then I love this. He instructs them. He gives them very specific details. Do you remember? Don't take extra food. Don't take a, you know. What is he doing? He's, <laughs> he's taking away all the things. I, and I picture Peter. It could have been other guys. But I picture Peter going, okay, okay. We're going to go. Uh, Nate, you and I are together. We're going to go. Do you have any extra, you have extra clothes? Can you, can you bring a tunic or two? I got a bag I can put clothes. Do you got any food? you got any bread? Okay. Do you got that walking stick still? Bring your walking stick. I'll bring my walking stick. Uh, what else do we need? We need to get some extra cash. You got any extra cash? Okay, I'll get some extra cash. And, you know, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go do what he's calling me to do, but here's how I'm going to do it. And Jesus preempts all of that, and he says, hold on, hold on. Come here. I got something for you to do. You're going to go together, and I'm going to be with you. You're going to have my authority. But let me remove anything that later on down the road, you might be tempted to say, yeah, that happened because I was really prepared. That happened because I'm gifted. That happened because, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me remove all of that so that it's abundantly clear to you what's already clear to me, that if you're going to be fruitful for me, if you're going to make disciples for me, then you've got to go in my strength. You've got to trust me. I think we read that list differently. Some of you, the planners, or Cindy's looking at that list and going, hold on a second, you know, let me get, let me, ca- can, Jesus, can you say that again? Because I want to make sure I didn't miss anything, and I want to make sure I check, you know, and planning's good, right? We have planners. But that's all removed. It's not about planners. It's not about personality. It's not about resources. It's not about capacity. It's not about us. Do we get that? It's not about us. It's about him. He calls us together. He sends us. It's his authority, and he will take care of us. So what he's telling them and he's telling me, I want you to go, but I want you to trust me. When we know, we go. Now just hover there for a minute. Amen, amen. When you know who Jesus is, that's when you'll go. When, it's, when it clicks, when the Holy Spirit opens you and you're not hearing me anymore, you're hearing him this morning and you have this picture in your head, wow, this is my creator, this is God, this is the one, Psalm 139, my whole life was designed by him, my everything, it's in his hands, all the days of my life, he already knew, he knew about this heat stro- uh, stroke, this heat trend, what do you call it, this heat wave, thank you, thank you young man, this heat wave that we're having, Ugh. He knew. He knew every single day of my life. He knew every challenge. He knew every painful, dark moment. He knows it all ahead of time. He knows all that. That's who he is. And he's eternal. And he's omniscient. And he's omnipotent. And he's immutable. He does not all these things. And this picture begins to form in my head of who this guy is that says, Kurt, I want you to go. When I know, that's when I will go. And it might be across the fence, it might be across the cubicle, it might be across the street, it might be to Ensenada, it might be to South Sudan, it might be 
fill in the name of, might be pg e contractor. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. Hey, maybe it's our marriage. Maybe it's my family. But when I know who he is and he sets the table, this is who I am. He reads from Isaiah. He makes it abundantly clear. He is the anointed, sent one by the Father. This is who Jesus is. And he lays it out for them. I'm him. Guys, come here. Come here. Here's what we're going to do. No, no, no. Peter, put, put the food away. You don't need that. Just all you need is your walking. I need an extra pair of shoes. These shoes are... No. No. You don't need just... You, all you need is me. And in that moment when they looked at him and said, oh, I know who you are, Jesus, that's when we'll go. So I, if you're like me, you've got names, you've got faces in your mind right now, people in your life that you've been thinking about. I need, I need to live out my faith in front of them. I need, to go, I need to interact with them. I need to stop talking baseball and football with, ball with them. And I need to start talking Jesus with them. I need to. I need to go fill in the blank. When you know who he is, that's what tips us over the edge to go, you know what, I'm going to go. And friends, don't wait for it not to be challenging. Don't wait for the fear to go away. I think the fear is always going to be there a little bit. The anxiety, what, I can't take anything with me? I can't, I can't pack? Don't let those things keep us from going. You know these words, Jesus came near in Matthew 28. He comes near to the same 12 guys. There were others as well. But this is a long time later, months later. He calls them to the mountain and he comes near to them and he reminds them of what he has said several times before. I, Jesus, am the source of all authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And here's what I want to do with that authority. I want to give it to you so that you can go. When you know, then you'll go. When you know who he is, you're confident of who he is, it doesn't matter what you're confident in yourself or what your resources are or all the obstacles, it won't matter. They will melt away because when you know, you'll go. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, obey everything I've commanded you, and remember this, I'm with you always to the end of the age. He's never going to yank his authority. He's never going to yank his presence from us. Joel promised that that would happen, and it happened, did it not? On Pentecost, and he came, and friends, he's here right now. The Spirit of God is right here. Two or three are gathered. He's here in a very special way because we've intentionally put ourselves within his sight and hearing so that we can see and hear him. And the Spirit of God is living in here. Believe it or not, he's in here. He's taken up residence in here, and he'll never leave. He will be with me to the end of my age. So he sends us by his authority. He sends us with his authority. He asks us to trust his authority. Is that important? When you know, you'll go. He sends us to engage people to know him. This is Matthew 28. Go engage people. Go across that cubicle, across that fence. You know who he is, then go. Go across the room. Go across the workplace. Go across the campus. Go across this room this morning. Go across the room in your, in your, in your life group. Engage people. Why? So that they would know as well. You see, disciples make disciples. This is where we started. What do disciples do? They go where their master goes. Well, the master has gone, folks. He's come, he's shown us, he's come to us, he's lived it out, and now he's at the right hand of the Father. And now he says, it's your turn, now you go. If you know who I am, then go. And engage that person that he's put in your life with the end result that they would also know. Because what will happen once they know? They will. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples. He sends us to empower people to love him. He wants us to know who he is and who we are to him. This is going to sound like a really old man thing to say, but I've never experienced a time where there's been a a greater need for people to know who they really are. We have lost our sense of identity, and I'm not talking just the church. I'm talking about our culture, our world. 
We've lost our sense of who we are, and we're trying to make it up. We're trying to remake it. We're trying to find something that's going to give us some, some sense of identity, who we are. Meanwhile, Jesus is saying, I know who you are. I made you, and this is what I have for you. I want you to know that. So baptize the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want people to know who I am and who you are to me. I want you to know, I want people to know that I have an identity for them. I want to adopt them into my family. I want, I, want, I want to give your life purpose. I want you to be a disciple maker for Jesus. Yes, it's a master. I have a master for you, but I have a life of discipleship for you, significance and purpose that can have eternal consequences. That's who you are to me. And baptize the name of the Holy Spirit because I want to actually move in. I want to move into your life. I want you to be the temple. I want you to be the representation of God, salt and light in a dark world. And it's like God is just crying from heaven, longing in his heart that, oh, I wish people would just recognize who they are. Look at their doing to themselves. Look at their doing to each other. Look how, look how they're treating life like it's meaningless and it's worthless. Oh, if they just knew who they were to me. And then he looks at us and says, if you know me, I want you to go. I want you to go and empower people. I want you to show them who they are to me and who I am to them. And then he sends us to equip people to obey him. I know obey is a four-letter word, but it's a good four-letter word when it comes to obeying him. And he sends us to encourage people to trust him. We're in a tizzy right now, aren't we? Who's going to be in the White House in November? It's not that I don't care, because I do care, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who is in the White House, because as Sean reminded me this morning, he's still King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we added President of Presidents, okay? <laughs> Guys, we can trust him. We can trust him in 2024 in an election year in Northern California. We can trust him. And we need, to, we need to do that. We need to encourage each other. That's what Jesus is telling us in Matthew 28. Encourage one another to trust him. How many of us have been guilty having a conversation about politics and we all get worked up and oh, you know, and then we even have arguments, right, on, on social media and we're back and forth and all in the name of truth which sometimes it is, but Jesus doesn't tell us any of that. He says, encourage one another to trust me. Let's make sure we vote, and let's make sure we have conversations with one another that reflect our confidence that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then you vote by the Bible. You vote your heart shaped by the Bible, but in our conversations, let's encourage one another to trust God. Whatever happens in November is not the end of his plan. Let me close with this thought, and I got 15 seconds. Aren't those amazing people? Can you recognize who they are? That's our team in Mexico. We're having a time of reflection looking out over the city. And one of the things that God gave me when I was in Mexico was this idea of sharing what you know about who you know in this way. It's very simple. I once was, I once lived life on my own terms. I was a young man, I had a plan for my life, and I was gonna become a, an engineer, and I was gonna make lots of money, and I was gonna get married and have kids and, and, and go to church, and I was gonna be a man that was intentional, a man that was strategic, a man that was gonna accomplish great things. But then Jesus spoke to me and said, hey, you know what, I have a different plan for your life. And it begins with, and I knew this, but it begins with what we remembered this morning, what he did for us on the cross. Kurt, I did that for you, and you have one right, and that is to live for me, to die to self and live for me. Because what a disciple does is he goes where his master goes, and he does, he practices what his master practices. And Jesus made it abundantly clear to me that he had a plan for my life. Now, I live for him. I struggle. I long for things that don't have any business in my life. I want things that the world has, but now I live for him. And every day he keeps pulling me back. Every day he shows me grace and mercy. Every day he picks me up when I stumble. He washes me off when I get all muddy and stuff and I return to my vomit like a dog and he cleans me up and he gets, puts good food in front of me and he keeps loving me and he keeps saying, do you know who I am? 
And I say, yes, Jesus, and then he says, go. Go. If you're, in, if you're gonna stay for one of our life groups, I'm gonna challenge you to do that, particularly in the sermon-based ones. But other teachers, if you have time, maybe spend a few minutes on this. Let's, and it's on your notes. If you don't have notes, grab one before you go to your life group in, in a little bit. And let's put, let's put some bullet points behind those. I once was, but then Jesus, now I. It's when we know, then we will we'll go. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. I thank you that you are good to us, and you call us back to yourself even when we say no and we don't go. Help us this morning, even in this moment now, as we turn our minds and hearts to what you've given us and we express our gratitude in singing. God, this is our our gift of worship this morning. This is our offering of worship. And as we do this, Holy Spirit, would you continue to speak to us? Open the eyes of our heart to see what it is that you have for us. I know that we'll find grace and mercy and your gentle voice saying, this is who I am, this is who I've always been, this is who I'll always be, you can trust me. Now go. So Father, we pray for courage and faith that we would take whatever you are giving us and that we would live it out. In Jesus' name, amen.